There are many things that we can learn by merely considering the achievements of our forebears. It is not difficult to make a new and useful application of some known and appreciated principle. But it is not easy to discover a principle. It is not easy to build without recourse to that which has gone before. And therefore we have a peculiar admiration for these basic thinkers of the race, flourishing in different times, without the facilities and advantages which we take for granted. We have to ask ourselves, how did they achieve these basic principles upon which all later knowledge has come to be built? There seems to be only one possible answer, and that is that there is a source of knowledge within the self, a power of reason to achieve a scientific exactitude a power of intuition to apprehend the truth of a matter, even though this truth cannot be immediately subjected to scientific verification. We do not know precisely how the philosophy of atomism came into existence. The first atomist is probably not remembered at all. But from the Greek records, it is believed that the theory was first promulgated at least in Western culture, in Phoenicia, at possibly a period prior to the Trojan War. This would probably mean, by general checking, that the atomic concept came to Greece as early as the 16th to 18th millennium of 18th century B.C. This means that it precedes the golden age of Greek philosophy. It contributed to this philosophy. But Greek philosophy was already dependent upon a much earlier tradition. We can therefore only say that what we call today the philosophy of atomism certainly existed at least 4,000 years ago. Also we know that its original development was largely religious. It was one of the religious convictions that gradually moved into the area of philosophy. And from philosophy in turn was taken over by science in the 17th and 18th centuries of the Christian era. We know, of course, that these first thinkers did not have the full advantage of the long research and thought that man has since devoted to this subject. We are not certain that all of their opinions are true. We suspect, however, that the peculiar integrity which enabled them to establish these basic concepts and hypotheses may also have given them some unusual intuitive grasp of the larger meanings which perhaps we are now ignoring. Certainly, at an early date, atomism became a distinct philosophy, a philosophy of spiritual, intellectual, moral, and also physical significance. With our new development in the field of atomics, we may therefore 
contemplate the possibility that here again a philosophical and religious structure may ultimately be built upon a scientific concept. Philosophy and religion made this concept possible. Philosophy and religion must perfect that which has more recently been achieved. In order that we can have some general perspective on this, I have attempted to set some kind of a starting point, to find some mind that in the past gathered up the still earlier fragments and presented them to us in a more consistent, organized pattern. This mind was nearer to the old foundations, and therefore may prove especially useful. The first and most important thinker that comes to mind in this relationship is Pythagoras of Samos. And I strongly suspect that he will ultimately be considered, if not the first, the greatest, of the Greek atomists. Now we are not inclined to consider Pythagoras in this light. We think of him more as a mystic, as a great contemplative thinker, strongly religious, and at the same time incorporating in his mentation many basic scientific disciplines and methods from an earlier source, Pythagoras derived his concept of the atom. Now our word atom, like our word psychology, has come gradually to mean the exact opposite of its original significance. The root thomas means cut or to divide. Atomus, or atom, therefore means that which cannot be divided. Now that is an interesting point, because we've made so much of this concept of smashing this minute particle, or creating a division within it by what we call fission. The indivisible concept, atom, became uh, significant to other Greek thinkers. And during the period of the Ptolemies in Egypt, Atom became a proper term for deity because of the concept that deity is indivisible. Pythagoras, searching for his term, a term which was later to be taken over by Leibniz, hit upon the concept of the monad. Therefore, to Pythagoras, the monad was the atom. Now the monad, according to the Pythagorean concept, was an indivisible unit. It should not be considered identical with one or any concept of numeration as such. The monad was the seed of number. The monad was number indivisible as absolute and ultimate unity. Therefore, in his thinking, the atom became the sovereign symbol of that which is essentially unchanging, inevitable, indivisible, infinite, and absolute. Pythagoras also pointed out that this term is peculiarly applicable, not to great mass, but to an invisible and minute thing, so small that it cannot be seen by the ordinary eyes of man. 
In these terms also we realize that our older philosophers were functioning without benefit of any instrument or device by means of which minute forms could be examined. The monad of Pythagoras was a philosophic atom, which he regarded as being the indivisible, ultimate smallness, the, the least comprehensible or conceivable unit that could exist. Pythagoras also, however, gave us a philosophical point which may have bearing upon our modern thinking, namely that this unit, immeasurably small, became the peculiar symbol and emblem of totality itself. This was the thing minute but also possessing the ultimate quality of power, unity. Therefore, the atom was not only the smallest of all things, but the most perfect. Being most perfect, it was most like the infinite itself. And the atom, therefore, became the symbol of the continuing seed of existence a very minute seed from which all things must by their natures grow. Therefore he termed this monad a seminal principle, a principle seed-like, capable of continually unfolding according to a principle. Now Pythagoras was already well enough aware of the general principles to conceive that the unfoldment of the atom or the primary seed could only be attained because this seed was able to gather to itself other atoms like itself and that growth was therefore an increasing aggregate of unchanging energy substance units. By this we mean that the atom actually did not merely extend itself. It exercised a kind of influence or force by means of which it attracted and repelled attracting according to one nature and repelling according to another. The continual attracting of atoms means the increase of mass. The division or breaking down, the repulsion of atoms, means the reduction of mass. The attraction and repulsion of atoms is due to another principle, this principle called energy. Therefore, the increase of energy activates atomic structure. The decrease of energy subtracts from atomic structure. The moment two or more atoms are brought together, a change takes place. For out of this union is produced the foundation or basis of mass. Mass is no longer composed primarily of parts. Intellectually, it is a continually developing unit. Therefore, mass represents a new kind of structure. But this structure is also, by its own nature, monadal or unified. It differs, however, from the basic atom or monad in one particular. This compound is dissolvable. For all things composed of parts and it can be dissolved by the dissolution of the parts. 
when all this illusion takes place to its infinite degree, and nothing remains that is separable, that which does remain is atom, which is no longer susceptible of further division. The Pythagorean concept was taken over by Leucippus, a philosopher following Pythagoras and preceding the period of Plato and Aristotle. Leucippus uh, had one or two further contributions to make. He was the first to point out that the universe itself could be divided into two essential qualities, conditions, or states. One of these he called ends, and the other he called non-ends. Ends is something. Non-ends is not something. That which is not something is nothing. That which is something must forever exist. And when all have, and every change has taken place in the condition of that which is something, it must be reduced to the basic symbol something. And this basic symbol of something is atom. This was perhaps his most luminous contribution to our problem. He did not, however, proceed as far as another philosopher who preceded him. And this other philosopher uh, gave us the theory which we now associate with the atomic philosophy of Democritus. This philosophy has to do with the final organization of the entire concept of ends and non-ends. So we will try to get a, a pretty fair survey of this, for it is in turn from him that the Platonic and Socratic concepts of atoms uh, gradually integrated to reach the highest condition or state which they attain in the Greek classical world. From that time on, the next most important change was brought about by the Arabian schools, largely vitalized by the early Jewish research in atoms, something we know very little about, generally speaking. But the work was hard progressed in that area. So we come back to the original concept of Lucippus, the existence of ends and non-ends, which now take the simple term atom and vacuum. Now, vacuum, of course, is obviously the non-ends. So, ex so existence itself consists of two primary qualities, atom and the absence of atom. Atom having an existence, has to exist somewhere. This somewhere must also be an environment that is negative to the atom. If the environment was positive, the atom would be overwhelmed. Its natural procedures would be frustrated, limited, or distorted. The only condition in which something can achieve its own consequences without inhibition or limitation of any kind is vacuum. Now, at the present moment, we are not considering vacuum to be a particularly congenial environment. But perhaps we must also bear in mind that our ancient friends conceive these terms with a somewhat different usage from that with which we are familiar. In the thinking of Democritus, atom and vacuum have one quality in common. Both are infinite. 
Atom is infinite in number. A vacuum is infinite in area. Beyond these qualities, nothing can be conceived. Uh, the Greeks were not prepared to say that vacuum came from anything. Nor were they prepared to say that atom came from anything. They affirmed somewhat in the psychology of Buddhism that atom was eternal. And that the term infinite implied not only number and duration, not only number and extent or expanse, but also duration. So we have infinite number, infinite space, and infinite time. Now time is not a thing in the sense that vacuum is a negative environment or atom a positive factor. Time, therefore, is the measure of the motion of atom in vacuum. Now, we're not speaking in terms of modern physics now. We're speaking in the thinking of the Greeks uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 centuries ago as this theory was being well developed about 450 B.C. What now, then, are we to consider to be the source of either vacuum or atom? Our philosopher tells us that there is no source, that these two are co-eternally existing, that there can never be a time, conceivable or inconceivable, when the infinite expanse, which we call vacuum, does not exist. Nor can there ever be a time in which atom, the primary inhabitant of vacuum, does not exist. Atoms do not come, according to the Greeks, from a previous condition of any kind, nor do they lead to a future condition of any kind. Under all circumstances, everywhere, always, they are themselves. This means uh, that they have a peculiar spiritual significance. If there is a God, according to the atomists, this God must partake of the nature of atom, or atom must become the appropriate symbol of the power of that deity. For it is therefore necessary for us to parallel the Greek concept of atom and say that the atom was never created and come immediately into one of the statutes of our Christian creed, God uncreated. In other words, without a source, a parent, or an origin. Now in theologies, in systems, and philosophies, these concepts have been assailed. But, for our purposes, we can follow for a little while the Greek thinking to the effect that the atom is an infinite structure and that it exists in an infinite place suitable for the continual existence of itself. Well, you have now this infinite mass of minute units existing in an infinite area of potential. What now do we have to have in order to have something happen? Obviously, something has to happen, because we cannot simply leave these atoms forever themselves and this space, or this vacuum, forever itself, without ending ultimately in a static condition. There is no impetus or factor present 
by means of which the motion of atoms is impelled. For the Greeks were very particular to point out that the, the atom itself does not possess the power to move itself. This brings in another dimension. And here's a point which perhaps someday will be useful to modern science. I believe there is some evidence that it is already being considered. The possibility of what we term atomic energy actually existing in the interval between atoms and not resident in the atom itself. This is a, a point in which more research will have to be carried on. It is possible that this thing we call atomic energy has been misnamed. In any event, the new factor, the new uh, element which has to be introduced, uh, presented a, a problem to these older people because in a strange way they were subtly materialistic. The Greeks produced many schools of materialistic philosophy, so did the Hindus. We cannot assume that all of these systems were pure idealism. They were not. There was in the Greek thinking a continual reaffirmation of scientific method. So they were confronted with what to call this agitating agent, by means of which something forever the same suddenly became different. Aristotle struggled with this and finally, more or less, concluded that this agent by which all things are moved was co-eternal with atom and vacuum. In other words, our duad becomes a triad. And we now have atom, motion, and vacuum. No good philosopher, however, could afford to leave motion just moving. He had to try to understand the significance of motion. So our old atomists came up with a very interesting concept. Namely, they called motion necessity. This is a, a rather interesting and startling point of view. You remember that Plato describes how the universe moves upon the spindle of necessity. Now the word necessity simply implies that certain things have necessary and inevitable attributes. Necessity is therefore not only the mother of invention, but for our atomists the mother of motion. Things must move. Now why must they move? Because it is necessary. This helps a little, but still leaves us on the forms of the principal dilemma. Why is motion necessary at all? We've often asked that question on another level. Why do we have to work? <laughs> when a certain kind of Physical inertia seems to be a most highly desirable state. Under the heading of necessity, the Platonists and several other sects among the Greek philosophers use the idea of an immutable and inevitable law forever operating. Necessity then begins to take the form of law. Motion is necessary because it is lawful. That this compound of ends and non-ends, atom and vacuum, not only has an existence, but has an existence in necessary, in necessary law. Therefore, certain processes are innate, not necessarily in the atom, 
not necessarily in the vacuum, but operating upon atom in vacuum. The necessity must be something needed by something. Therefore, necessity is not needed by vacuum. Vacuum being nothing. Vacuum needs no modification or change because there is nothing to modify or to change. Therefore, law has a natural affinity for atom rather than for vacuum. For necessity can only accomplish is some means of accomplishment, some substance upon which accomplishment may take place, how also has an existence. Here our Greeks began to cater a little uh, to the popular thinking of their time and introduced a spiritual equation. We may say they did it reluctantly, even as modern science does it reluctantly. But there are certain problems that cannot be solved unless we make some kind of sense out of necessity. We cannot conceive of motion without a power called the mover. Things do not move of themselves, according to our atomists, therefore they must be moved. They cannot be moved by vacuum because nothing can move anything. They must be moved, therefore, by something. That something must also, because of the manifested result, be a motion of order. This movement is not a continuing accident. This movement is an intent. That which indicates intent must imply the existence of that which intends. So we have the gradual emergence of an intending power. This intending power cannot be said to be identical with Adam. It must, therefore, be another force. The animists took the attitude, therefore, that there was this intending power which they termed necessity or motion. That this motion moved always according to its own nature. Therefore, there was an inevitable, immutable, unchangeable motion termed oblique. And every atom existing in vacuum was subject to continual agitation by the presence of motion. Motion of itself, therefore, becomes a kind of providence. It also becomes a kind of providence because it provides the solution to the continuing arrangement and rearrangement of atoms. So our next step in our thought, or in our problem, is to conceive a vacuum as a kind of a vast bottle in which atom is in constant agitation. This agitation being considered primary motion and also inevitable or necessary motion. Necessary not because it was ordained, but because it exists. And that which is so is necessary. This removed certain moral factors from the issue, but did not entirely close it, as we will point out a little later. Motion, moving atoms, resulted in a further 
condition for which classical philosophers had to invent an explanation. And they did it with extraordinary uh, ingenuity. We are told, even as early as Lucippus, that atoms, though composed of one inevitable substance, differing in no way substantially, essentially, or in quality, one from another, had certain difference. One of the reasons why difference has to exist is because that which is the same cannot be differentiated. Consequently, the fact that there can be more than one atom must imply that there is a certain antipathy in atoms. Otherwise, they would immediately coalesce into an indivisible mass and remain that way forever. This does not happen. Consequently, there has to be some kind of difference. And to these early people, there were two kinds of differences which they, they could accept in their atomic theory. One was difference in magnitude, and the other was difference in form. That which is alike in nature, essentially alike, may therefore differ in size, some being greater than others in mass or quantity. They might also as Democritus points out, differ in shape, and a new infinity is bestowed upon our problem. Infinite formal differentiation. In other words, all atoms, in some mysterious way, differ from each other. These differences may be so slight that the invisible atom, not even to be seen, cannot be estimated in terms either of similarity or dissimilarity, but it can still exist. Now for the next point that we have to make, we can perhaps use the illustration of a pool table. The uh, pool balls have been racked and have been formed into a triangle. The first player, using the cue ball, strikes the apex, or near the apex, of the triangle of racked balls, causing this triangle to splinter into many different directions, each of the separate balls moving to a different part of the table before they stop motion. This, uh, according to the Greek theory, would explain how an atom, here represented by the cue ball, coming into violent contact with other atoms, results in this breaking or smashing of an arrangement of atoms. In this case, however, the breaking or smashing is due to an oblique falling motion in which the particular atom we are using as an example strikes other atoms, separates from them, deflects those smaller or lesser than itself, is deflected by those greater than itself, and before it gets through, makes some of the finest billiard shots that you could possibly imagine. These Atoms, moving therefore, are said to move eccentrically because their motion is impaired or conditioned or deflected by themselves in their interrelationship. Those atoms which by some nature 
are of a similar constitution, exercising a commonly cohesive principle, or, as Democritus said, by their shapes interlocking, begin the building up of mass. Mass results in the existence or manifestation of a new quality, and that is the attractive power of mass. And gradually, mass, by its attractive power, gains momentum and causes more and more atoms to be drawn into the orbit of an increasing mass. The result of this, said our Greeks, is the creation of planets. Now, we are not ready, perhaps, to assume that that early this was contemplated, but actually it was. Now, the uh, Greeks, trying to explain uh, the different kinds of things that come into existence from the same basic aggregate of units, also make use of a principle derived from the Pythagorean pattern. If you take five toothpicks, and lay them side by side. You can contemplate this a little arrangement in two ways. You can say of these toothpicks, here are five one toothpicks. Five single toothpicks. Or you can simply say, this is five. Now five is not identical with five ones. It is a new concept. It is a new existence because five ones are separate things. The five is a unity composed of five parts. So the tendency of the mind is forever to conceive number in terms of unity. And wherever we ch transform the concept of separate units into any type of compound figuration, we create archetypal patterns, which Pythagoras calls the numbers. If with this five, which we have thus created, we remove a toothpick, Immediately, five as a unit, or unity, ceases to exist. And in its place is generated a new unity, called four. Four is not just four ones. If to these five original toothpicks we add another, then the unit five disappears, and in its place is a new archetypal concept. Six. Thus, in all things, as the Greeks pointed out, the shape of the number six, when you draw it, is different from the shape of the number five. Perhaps this is the difference between a rose bush and a sequoia tree. It is the difference in the overall unit concept. The Greeks did not affirm that there was any essential difference between the basic elements involved in the constructions of existing things. Existing things not only depended upon one basic substance, but for their differentiation depended very largely upon the differentiating, analyzing power of the human mind. The five ones are always there, but the numeral five is possible only to the creature man. This is a philosophical point. Therefore, man is the only creature interested in the fact that there is any difference between the tree 
and the horse. The horse is not interested. The tree is not interested. But man, because he possesses certain faculties, becomes keenly aware of apparent difference. And by apparent difference is impelled to assume essential difference. An impulse which is not, according to the Greeks, fully justified. So now, we have not only the problem of explaining the accumulation of formal structure, but we come right down to something that we can't deny today, although we do not understand it perhaps very much better than the Greek did. Namely, that something, they call it the atom, is the common denominator of everything that has an existence. The only thing which is not included among those things over which the atom exercises this common denominative power is vacuum. Consequently, it makes no difference, as Lucippus himself pointed out, whether you are referring to water or fire or the human body or the emotions of man, or the coloring of flowers, it makes no difference what you refer to. All of these things are composed of invisible, minute units that cause difference not from their substance, but from their arrangement. And consequently, everything that, it, that exists is a structure built of single blocks, and these blocks are atoms. Now, it is rather interesting that a thoughtful person 25 centuries ago came to that conclusion and remained true to it, because in those days there was certainly very little to build this upon. One early thinker has suggested that the whole thinking came as a result of allowing a handful of sand to run through your fingers, that perhaps this was the clue, and the gradual recognition that by mixing certain cements with this sand you could create permanent blocks that could be used for various purposes. So we have the sand, we have a foundation or a space waiting for the blocks, and we have a cement, and this cement, in this case, is essentially the principle of continuing motion. The Greeks also held that all of these structures were in continuous change, but that this change was so gradual that it was not noticeable, but that in time, every form or structure even the most permanent things in nature, uh, would be totally altered. Therefore, all things are in a continuous state of increasing atoms, or losing atoms. All growth, progress, enlargement, or expansion implies the increase. Where this fails, decrease is inevitable. Democritus tells us that man replenishes the body by inhaling atoms, and that the moment the respiratory process ceases and new atoms are not taken into the system, death is inevitable. That life is therefore the continual replenishment of the atomic units uh, from which the structure of man is composed. Now, we probably don't agree in everything with this, but it was pretty good thinking for its time. And someday, our so-called very good thinking is going to look just as imperfect. Because we are a long way from the ultimate solution of even the common problems that we are working with on the level of physics today. 
particularly, particularly in the area of nuclear physics. This brings our Greek to the next situation. We have another factor in all things besides form, growth, diminishment. We have another principle which we call vitality, animation. All things that have forms are in some way also alive. Now, actually, the atom, as such, as visualized by the ancients, was neither alive nor dead. It was simply a minute, indivisible thing. Yet out of the aggregation of these atoms, there comes a structure which in turn begins to manifest peculiarities and characteristics. In some of these structures, as in the bird, we find the magnificence of flight. In others, as the plant, wonderful shapes and forms and patterns with magnificent color. We also find that these forms composed of atoms develop the power of propagating themselves. And this became quite a serious matter. For although the Greeks were perfectly willing to recognize the building of the new body as merely a repetition of the process of the integration of atoms, they were still up against many very difficult situations upon which to build solutions. So, Democritus tells us of another thing, that what we call mind is also an aggregate of atoms. Emotions are aggregates of atoms. Dreams, which we consider fantasies, are temporary aggregates of atomic patterns within the mind that any form of any kind which can be conceived or imagined, visualized, or brought into existence upon any level of awareness, subjective or objective, if it has an appearance, if it can be differentiated from nothing, it must be something. And if it is something, it is absent. The next concept that came to, the, to these people was an early realization that no matter how materialistic you might like to be, there is something different between bodies and souls. Now this was a rather difficult one. Souls and bodies could have one common denominator, atoms. This was not too difficult because atoms being invisible anyway, they might aggregate in one way to form a visible structure, and they might aggregate in another way to form an invisible but equally real structure. So our Greeks tell us, that a form, which is an aggregation of atoms, may be either visible or invisible. It does not have to be visible. To say that all forms must be visible is to deny the fact that the atom is a form, and that this form is invisible. Therefore, being invisible in itself, that which it produces may likewise be invisible. But what is invisible? Invisible is not something that has no form. Invisible is that which cannot be cognized by the faculty range of the human sensory perceptions. 
Consequently, we have arbitrarily created a concept. It is visible, it is so. It is invisible, it is not so. Depending entirely for this concept upon the limited range of our own visual faculty. The Greeks had outgrown that thought long before the beginning of the rise of modern thinking. They were perfectly aware that wind is invisible, except that it can be felt. That soul is invisible, but it also can be felt. And this feeling is an experiencing, a discovery through use, a discovery through the fact that we apprehend a power without being able to define the boundaries of the form of that power. The uh, atomist would have gone far enough to say that even a sound spoken could not be heard did it not create an atomic pattern that we hear because sound has become a form or has gathered atoms. But this type of form or gathering of atoms is not visible, but it can be heard. Therefore, different sensory perceptions may therefore be capable of becoming aware of different atomic compounds. We, we can't go, we can't differ too much from this or from their concept that the odor of a flower was due to atoms thrown off from that flower, which could be measured because they struck against the, set, the very subtle substances of the olfactory nerve, producing inevitable re reflexes in the brain. So our atoms can form many different types of structures. And one of the structures that they formed was the soul. Now, it's not too difficult to create a soul. It is just another kind of body until you reach a certain point. And then you have to uh, either step into new, into new ground, or else you have to fall back upon this process of regressive evasion. We have to, uh, we have to say that the soul is a certain structure possessing certain attributes, or that the soul is a structure receiving attributes, or emanating from a preceding structure. Now the Greeks say to, the, say to us, we know that physically forms, particularly animal, human, plant, reproduce their kind. Therefore, that they are able to send forth a motion by means of which a new pattern, similar to the original pattern, is gradually built up, the phenomenon of growth being nothing but the rapid increase in the number of atoms. The other concept was that if the soul is a structure composed of atoms, that it is quite conceivable that these two structures can exist in the same place at the same time, and that they are also capable of separating and returning to each other. That whichever form, as Pythagoras says, is the more subtle, must permeate that which is less subtle. Socrates uses a rather common concept of this and has since been very popular. Namely that you can fill a glass with sand. And when it is entirely full, you can then take a cup of water and pour that into the glass. The reason being that we are working with two different groups of atomic structures, one of which can penetrate the other. Only for one reason, as 
uh, Democritus also pointed out. And that is that in the atomic structure, the atoms, though form forming a mass, actually do not constitute a solid. In other words, if we could magnify this structure sufficiently, we would discover that no two atoms touch each other. They come into proximity. They meet. But they seem to meet by another quality. And this other quality is the fact that the atom itself is a kind of double nucleus, one which we know today, and which we have attempted uh, in various ways to bombard. If this be conceived possible, as the Greeks held it, then the soul could permeate the body. It could enter and depart from it, moving between the atoms of the body. By the same means, the soul could move through a door that is closed, because the atoms in the wood are not in the same quantity-quality relationship as the atoms in the soul. But two doors striking each other will not so penetrate each other. Consequently, the soul has a power of approaching and moving into unity with substance. And when these two meet, something new is created namely an increasing density. Because now we have the soul atoms filling in some of the spaces between the physical atoms. If we wish to go still further and assume with Pythagoras the existence of a spiritual substance composed of a still more refined type of atom, then this, in turn, could permeate both of the others. And we would therefore be capable of having in one place three atomic structures united in one compound, the parts of which might be referred to as spirit, soul, and body. Out of this type of philosophizing also came the problem of immortality. Immortality uh, to the Greek atomists was very difficult to explain in terms of a universe composed only of atoms and vacuum. They did go so far, however, as to be a little dogmatic, and after all, you must defend your principles if you believe them. And they decided that if there were, were such places as heaven, earth, and hell, they were obviously composed of atoms. <laughs> that heaven was built up of some kind of an atomic aggregate, less visible, more subtle, but no more, but no less factual than the physical earth upon which we walk. And of course they had us all, and they always have had us, on one point. Namely, if this mystery could produce the earth, it could produce almost anything else. So there is only a degree of the incredible that we have to deal with. Also, if there were these regions in space, they were, no, no, they were not essentially different from the elemental or elementary disbursements on the earth. There are vast regions we call ocean, most of which have been never have never been explored. There are other regions which we call mountainous, still others that we call uh, level plains or valleys. There are elements of air, of water, of fire, and of earth, and these are all present in the mysterious compound of nature. Most of these elements are comparatively invisible. 
except in very large aggregations. But if there can be a world of water and a world of air, there can also be a world of ether, a world of mysterious regions extending around us or even permeating us. The Greeks went so far as to speculate that many universes, all composed of atoms, but all keyed to different vibratory core motions, could exist in the same place at the same time. That the distance from here to some other order of existence uh, might not even be measurable in, in any interval whatsoever. As we move our hand through the air, we may be moving it through the palace of the king of an invisible world. We do not know. And we still don't. But if we must go on with this speculation, and the Greek felt he had to, it then came to his conclusion, or he came to the conclusion, that the invisible universe of gods, of demons, of spirits, of any kind of religious being, that this could only, these could only be other forms of atomic compounds. Now what the, the Greeks call the gods, according uh, to uh, Democritus, were actually beings composed of atoms, as man is, but more subtle, because more subtle, more refined by nature, for this reason also more erudite, more intuitive, more mystically aware, and because of having a finer nature, be capable of permeating or penetrating other things. But other things, being of a grosser nature, could not penetrate them. Therefore, the pattern of understanding itself, an atomic process, would make it possible for the superior to understand the lesser, but not permit the lesser to understand the superior. Therefore, the individual, lacking the refinement, which we might even measure in terms of brain cell structure, is limited in his possibility to comprehend, whereas another creature with a more finely organized atomic structure might comprehend him. This being the conceivable situation, what then is the power of the gods in the, in the thinking of the atomists? The same kind of power that would be available uh, to a most venerable and learned person who having exceeded all worldly insight, all knowledge such as we may possess, was able because of finer organic structure, meaning atomic structure, capable of a, of a superior consciousness existence and abiding in a region or place more subtle than our own and therefore incomprehensible to us. This did not mean that the, the atomists assumed that this superior being created the earth. He could not so assume, because he believed the creative process to be eternal. Therefore, the deities become more in the concept of the hermetic adepts, they become beings capable of exercising a greater directive power over structure, but were not responsible for the creation of that structure. That even these beings must ob ab abide by and obey the simple law of necessity upon which the entire creation moves. If a being then by process of disintegration, departs from one atomic structure by focal awareness, 
to another atomic structure. What then shall we say actually happens? The atomist would tell us that the psychic structure, the psychic field, or the psychic atomic entity could not possibly enter into the compound of matter or the lower form of atomic instrument and there become bound, held, or fettered. This psychic atomic being could comprehend matter, could choose to abide in it, could choose to depart from it, but could not be bound to it. Furthermore, in man, there are evidences of two processes of function going on continuously. The Greek atomist decided that man had two minds. One of these minds arising from the atomic structure of the body. The other arising from the more subtle atomic structure of the soul. But this is itself a bit of a problem because we've suddenly introduced mind into something where we have as yet provided no place for mind. We have still only atoms, motion, and vacuum. So now we have to try to figure out what the mind factor really means. I think what they would want us to realize is that the atom itself, as we now know, while it is a unit, and while it is theoretically indestructible, although we attempt and have apparently been able to crack it. But the concept is that the atom itself, although it is a unit, is also a compound. Therefore, an atom being composed of a certain number of different parts within itself the structures created by the aggregation of atoms are compound structures, not simple structures. In other words, from these various procedures, it means that when the atoms unite, more than one type of unity is established. There is a unity set up for each of the parts of the atom. Now, the Greeks appeared to assume that emotion and thought are actually aggregates of certain parts of atoms, not separated from the atom, but resulting from the uniting of many atoms, a compound is set up representing either emotional or mental processes. The mind itself having apparently two natures intrigued them a lot. Apparently the highest parts of the physical atom pattern became a sort of custodian of the rest. As certain laws, the necessity principle was released through the atomic compound. This necessity principle led to the primary intellection of man, namely survival. That the individual lived to gratify whatever seemed to bring pleasure to the body in which he lived. To gratify the appetites of the atomic unit. Now we are not sure what these appetites are. And the Greeks, frankly, held with Buddha that these appetites are not real. It was supposed that most of the atomists were addicted to a cult of pleasure. This is not strictly true, because their idea of pleasure was normalcy. Simply the process of living well, not the process of indulging the faculties or the sensory perception. But the kind of mentation 
that was obviously associated with the grosser atomic structure of body was assumed to perish with it. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The soul of the body died with it. But the Greeks also recognized that there was another kind of soul, a being living in a region of its own, that by necessity, again, this soul came into a certain fraternity with body. But the purposes of this soul were not essentially body purposes. For this soul was capable of creativity, of imagination, of genius, of great idealism, of poetry, art, drama, music, morality, religion, and ethics, that this soul could ponder imponderables, <clears throat> that it could reach out as the only creature that we know that is truly concerned with its own destiny and is conceivably willing and able uh, to cooperate in the attainment of destiny. This soul, therefore, was believed to be simply a another person. A person of better character and nobler purposes. This is not infallibly so, because it could be that the soul has been corrupted by circumstances, or has compromised its own existence, or has transformed its natural psychic act aptitudes into destructive courses, and therefore has become a corrupted soul. But normally speaking, the soul was regarded as a friend of the body, therefore brought into communion with it, but not dependent upon it for either its insight or its inward life. The soul naturally existing in its own condition was therefore a contemplative body which could survive without the support of body, physical body. But the physical body could not be purposeful without the cooperation of the soul. Yet the body could survive under certain conditions, separation from the soul. But if it did so, it became uh, an idiot, or a thing without any inner psychic guidance. This also then brought into a new concept the Pythagorean theory of monad. Namely that body, being composed of a mass of minute units, ultimately attempted to affirm its own archetypal unity over the total. Therefore, all things being composed of parts, all parts in turn, are, are impelled to a state of unity. Thus the soul is not only made up of atoms, but by aggregate it is a compound atom. Body composed of atoms becomes also a compound atom. The moment the body or the soul or any unit becomes a complete atom or is united to form a total unity or a monadal existence, this complete unity or the new atom, the mass atom, now reasserts its original condition, namely, that it exists in vacuum, that it is that it is atom, vacuum, and motion. This also means that this soul, as Socrates tells us, quantitatively begins to move. And according to its nature, it moves into proximity with other atoms compounded like itself. When this occurs in the course of the building of culture, we find savagery give place to civilization, 
isolation to community existence. And we find the gradual enrichment of comradeship in every part of life. Further than this uh, more or less accidental or incidental relationship, however, is that this compound, moving obliquely like the atoms of which it is composed, begins to move in an ascending arc. An ascending arc, in this case, has one essential difference from a descending arc. Things falling fall precipitously, and striking other things, shatter them or scatter them, as in the case of the pool balls. Things ascending, however, move slowly. Their motion is less rapid, and the confusion of the descending object and the probability of the ascending unit striking or disintegrating other units is lessened. Consequently, to the Greeks, this oblique ascent meant that gradually the ascending soul moved out of the area of the falling atoms and came to a state of comparative rest. The ascension of soul, therefore, was an infinite movement upward in an infinite vacuum, going on and on and on. If the motion is only in vacuum, then quality has to have some other explanation or some other interpretation. The only other possible interpretation is that this compound atom differs from the primary atom in one respect, namely that it is now composed of an infinite number of parts. These infinite parts having resulted in a series of compounds, it is as though you took a compound chemical and united it with another compound chemical. In this case, you would increase the compound elements. Out of this increase by compound, in which a number of different patterns react upon each other within the structure itself. There arises what uh, the atomists call friction. This friction, in turn, becomes the basis of a certain, not psychic consciousness now, but the releasing of the fire principle in the atom. They were quite definite as to what this all meant. And to them, this began to explain what you might term the spirituality of the atom. That gradually, the atom was brought, the compound of the atom was brought to a certain state. In this state, all of its elements were more and more complicated until finally the individual existed in the midst of an almost incomprehensible complexity. To a certain measure, we are in this state now, of this, in, this incredible diversity. Not only diversity in life around us, but diversity in quality within us. To break from this diversity again, there has to be some kind of a process. And the ancients, to a measure, seem to have anticipated a direct procedure by means of which the compound was dissolved. I think that if we had tried to understand what they would have meant by the splitting of the atom, uh, by this mysterious process of the release of a tremendous energy, that they would have expressed it in the idea that by a certain act of volition, a bombarding of the compound with certain concepts, 
consciousness, energies, methods, disciplines. That the compound could be brought to a point where it sundered, where the entire atomic structure fell apart. And in so doing, uh, the entire mysterious, intangible quotient that had been built up by all of this compounding was suddenly reduced again to its most primary nature. I suspect that this is almost the basis of Buddhistic philosophy. The concept being that the illumination or the Mahaparanavana of Buddha was the splitting of the atom. That it was the voluntary demolishment of the chain of atomic sequences which had been set up by the entire process of evolution and generation. Man being bound by generation to evolutional process continues to complicate his nature until finally he reaches what has been termed the stage of enlightenment. Now in the description of the transfiguration of Jesus or in the description of the crucifixion or in the case of the illumination of Buddha and again in the ultimate consuming of Buddha at the time of, of the great decease or the end of life as represented and unfolded in the Dhammapada we have always the same story. At the time of the death of Christ, the veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom. The earth opened. Tremendous cataclysms moved the deep. The sky was clouded. And a vast light was seen. In the case of Buddha, it is said at the moment of the Mahaparanavana, the blaze of glory from the released consciousness extended beyond the duration of ten universes. And as this builds up and piles up in fictional account, it seems as though what we are being told is the tremendous release of the universality of life energy. That this release, in a sense, is not the reduction of the atom or the destruction of it, but is the sudden and instantaneous reversal of the entire process of atomic structure and structural building. Now, if the Greeks had been confronted with a simple problem of what would have happened had the atom been split, conceiving that the indivisible could be divided, I, I rather think from the writings of Pythagoras and some of the Neoplatonic thinkers uh, that their conclusion would then be that the dissolution or the breaking up of the unity of an atom would and would have to be the greatest uh, consternation that could exist in the universe for the reason that in this uh, there would be the transition between ends and non-ends. If in an instant the energy of being, even of the most minute being, is suddenly and instantaneously released in vacuum, this would represent the most terrible combustion of which the human consciousness can conceive because it would be the sudden annihilation of a thing. If this annihilation was voluntary as in the Paranavana, it meant the return of the being to the state of pure life. In the case of the atomic thinker, among the older people certainly, it would represent the sudden revelation of the total potential of this mysterious thing called the atom. Now the atom, according to the Greek, 
had no peculiar qualities of its own. Vacuum had no peculiar qualities of its own. But when atom, as thing, moves into vacuum as not thing, it makes the longest and most terrific journey that is conceivable by the human mind. For the transformation of thing to not thing is as incredible as the transformation from not thing to thing. This would mean that Adam potentially had one point in common with vacuum. Namely, that Adam was capable of being diffused in vacuum. That Adam released into vacuum expands indefinitely and infinitely. That this transformation then would conce- conceivably be the greatest change that can exist or could occur anywhere in space. Now, if this atom suddenly is actually dissipated in vacuum, it might have somewhat the same relationship as a moving object passing through the sound barrier. This atom would have to pass through the quality, time, motion, energy barrier between being and not being. Atom as would have to suddenly reverse its polarity and attain, attain identity with vacuum. Uh, I believe that this would be interpreted in ancient thinking as total combustion. That this total combustion would not only have its physical significance, but its spiritual significance as well. And the uh, atomist would probably go on to try to interpret the meaning of the possibility of an existing thing actually ceasing to exist. This would mean something entirely different from death. Nothing of a parallel nature at all. It would mean uh, the motion of a thing to the extinction of itself. This could, or the extinction of the atom can only be one procedure, one fact. And that is its total identity with vacuum. This would probably be the most incredible situation that could arise because it would require a violation of every relationship existing in nature. Actually, probably also, when the thing is all summed down and we get through with the whole problem, we will probably discover we haven't done it. We will probably discover that what we have actually achieved is not the annihilation of an atom, or its actual, the actual destruction of its own unity, which means the total violation of its own archetype, the complete sundering of relationship with pattern. But that what actually has been accomplished, or so-called accomplished in this procedure, has simply been the release of certain areas of energy uh, which are resident in atom. Now, the Greeks do not give us this concept of a total energy present in atom, but they tell it in another way. They point out that there is only atom and vacuum, and then they create the universe. This means only one thing, that the universe has to reside in atom just as the oak tree resides in the acorn. By the gradual process of growth, the oak tree unfolds the potential of the acorn in a quiet, reasonable, orderly manner until it attains its growth. Then this tree in turn has its own acorns. These in turn become trees 
And in the course of time, if you wish to diagram this, say in a thousand years, your single acorn would have become a great forest of trees. This would go on and on and on. Supposing, however, at the moment of the sprouting of the first acorn, within which all of this archetypal expression is locked, the absolute rela release of this energy was instantaneous. Instead of producing generation after generation of trees, enlarging and multiplying their number, spreading over a great area of land, perhaps ultimately creating a forest for the whole earth, supposing this entire release had been made instantaneous. Instead of an orderly development of forests, there would be a sudden and inconceivable blast of power because it is actually the power in the first acorn that may 10,000 years later still produce further trees. This power is carried from tree to tree in generation, until perhaps we can imagine that one acorn became the basis of all the oak trees that we know. But suppose that one acorn had released all its power at once, there would have been no oak trees as we know them. There would have simply been a diagrammatic blaze, a tremendous release of force. And this release of force would not be under the guidance of necessity or under the relationship of law. It would have been actually what the atomic uh, bomb is, an instantaneous explosion. Had man not tampered with this atom, to go back now again to our Greeks, if man had not tampered with this atom, this atom might have become ultimately, through aggregation, the core of a planet. This planet in turn might gradually, through the continual growth of itself, become a sun. This sun in turn might become the central center of a cosmic system. And so on and on and on. But suddenly, the power of this atom to grow, or to release energy, was released instantly. Therefore, we have this tremendous, instantaneous growth. But if we diagrammatically present this, what is the difference? The difference has been that the energy has been released too rapidly to permit the function of growth. Therefore, instead of expansion, we have explosion. Instead of life enriching itself, we have had it expanding itself. Now, ultimately, all life must expand itself. But it expands itself in the maturity and in the final decline of its species. The arc of energy finally dies out in the extinction of forms of life. But in this case, this breaking of the patterns was a sudden release of energy. Now, it wasn't total, because I'm firmly convinced that the total release of the energy of a single atom would constitute not less than a complete solar disaster. In other words, take the solar system with it at least. This is only a relative degree, only a slight degree. And I am further convinced that beyond a certain degree, the processes used by man cannot operate. That it is quite impossible for man to explode or release the total potential of the atom. But that it is possible for him to do what he has done, he cannot deny. What follows? What is the result of the sudden release of the life of an atom into the field of vacuum? Is this the thing the Greek never really understood? 
is the ultimate end of all atomic compound to be a dissolution by which a kind of overcharge is poured into vacuum. Does all atomic activity ultimately result in the change of vacuum? Does vacuum gradually alter its own nature? All of the atoms return to their own existence, but by the process of gathering, accumulating, building, finally dividing, and disintegrating their compounds and returning back into themselves, is this motion producing something else in vacuum. The Platonists believed it did, for they believed that the world soul, the psychic nature of existence, was built up from the constant overcharge from the atomic action into the field of vacuum, and that there gradually rose in vacuum another dimension or another factor. And this factor was the total psychic energy of the universe. And out of this factor arose what Socrates called the good, the power by means of which the infinite repetition of atomic experience resulted in the shift from the concept of necessity to the concept of morality. That first the necessary required all things. Ultimately, the good provides all things. So that the energy cycle of the atom does not exhaust itself by infinite repetition. But in this process, a plus factor is added through the cycle of growth. This plus factor continues to build a plus. That is not another kind of atom primarily primarily, but an energy or an essence. And that this essence is the secret of the ultimate release of life from the endless repetition of the atomic cycle sequence. Well, this is the basic thinking of the Greeks on the matter. And now that you thoroughly understand this, we will then prepare ourselves for an Asiatic evening a week from tonight. Thank you very much.